Hello, I'm Alice and I work for the Marine Conservation Society. I'm here today as part of the Eco Young and Engaged virtual event to talk to you about the ocean and why it matters to us. I'm also going to zoom into Sussex and talk about Kingmere Marine Conservation Zone, a really amazing protected space just off our beach. So I hope you enjoy. So it doesn't matter if you live by the sea and you go all the time or if you've never been. We are all connected to the ocean wherever we live and I'm going to tell you how. So the ocean literacy principles explain how we are connected to the ocean and why it matters. So the earth has one big ocean with many features and over the years we have named the oceans of the world but we now know that all these basins are connected by a massive circulatory system and so in actual fact there's only one ocean which is shown by this picture of the earth sort of spun on its side. 70% of our planet is covered by the sea and of all the water in the world, 97% of it is salty. So it makes the ocean sound enormous, but its resources, everything in it, is still finite. The ocean and life in the ocean shapes the features of the earth. So over millennia, sea level change, both the sea rising and falling have created and destroyed areas of land. And we can see this where we live through erosion, both on the left where we allow it to happen naturally and on the right where we try to stop it happening through sea defences. The ocean is a major influence on weather and climate. So remember that circulatory system that I showed you. So this massive beating heart of our world moves heat, water and carbon around the world. So what happens is the ocean absorbs the sun's rays and it heats up. And this heating makes the water rise and move. And as it moves, it loses its heat and so it cools and sinks. And this creates the circulatory system. So this heating and cooling is natural and it's what drives the ocean movement and indeed its interaction with our weather. So warm seas especially create conditions for all sorts of weather such as hurricanes and cyclones as well as drought and rain. The ocean is integral to the water cycle. So every time it rains, wherever you are, the water droplets have mostly come from the ocean. The ocean also dominates the Earth's carbon cycle. So particularly important when thinking about climate change, the ocean absorbs roughly half of the carbon dioxide and methane that's added to the atmosphere. And because half of all plant life lives in the ocean, it means that it has a really important role in capturing carbon. So the ocean made Earth habitable. So most of the ocean in our atmosphere originated from prehistoric plants that came from the ocean where life is thought to have first started. The ocean supports a great diversity of life and ecosystems. So when you think of all of the fantastic life in the seas, whether it's the blue whale, the biggest living organism on earth, we also have enormous fish like tuna that get to be around three meters long. Say that's about two to three times as big as you are. We've got hydrothermal vents, the only known areas of um, life on our planet that are not driven by sunlight. We have coral reefs, some of the most diverse habitats on, the, on Earth, and also estuaries, a local place that is really hard to live. Sea life has to be adapted to survive both fresh and seawater. So the ocean and humans are interconnected. 
So as I mentioned earlier, half of all plant life lives in the sea. So that means that also half of the oxygen we breathe also comes from the ocean. So just think of that, every second breath we breathe is with oxygen from the sea. So a lot of fresh water comes from the ocean. We also get food, minerals, energy, medicine and recreation from the ocean. It supports jobs and national economies and much of the world's population lives by the ocean. We're also linked by how humans shape the ocean too. We have removed much of the fish and polluted it and changed it by adding sea defences and building in it. So we love the ocean but we don't always look after it. And finally, the ocean is largely unexplored. We think we know about 5% of the ocean. Understanding it requires more exploration and research, and we need to better understand it if we want to continue living on this planet. Jobs like being biologists and chemists, weather climatologists, computer programmers, and animators and illustrators and artists all helped us to understand and communicate the ocean. So I've explained why the ocean in general is important to us, but what about Sussex? Is Sussex any different or special? So I'm going to talk about an area off of West Sussex near to Worthing, Goring and Littlehampton that is a protected space called Kingmere Marine Conservation Zone. It's located about five to ten kilometres out to sea and it's full of absolutely amazing wildlife. But I think that's enough of me talking about it. Let me show you a dive into Kingmere Marine Conservation Zone. just fantastic and Kingmere is such a um, special place it's so brilliant to have such amazing wildlife living so nearby so it's the job of the government to look after the wildlife within Kingmere Marine Conservation Zone and in particular there are three things there that are specifically protected by law so the first is chalk reef 
Now chalk is a globally rare habitat and it's found within Kingmere Marine Conservation Zone and the rocks are grouped together like cliffs and they are called the Worthing Lumps. Now this really amazing animal is protected too, it's called a black sea bream and every year they arrive to Kingmere and other places along the Sussex coastline to spawn. So what happens is the males um, will build a nest which is really unusual for a fish. He will move kilos of gravel to expose uh, the bedrock beneath where the female will lay her sticky eggs which he will then fertilize and guard until they hatch about two weeks later. He guards the eggs from predators but he also keeps them oxygenated by fanning them with his tail. After the eggs have, hatch it, have hatched the male fish will generally um, stay about and then move away to continue his migration. The baby fish will move inshore looking for areas of seaweed and protected places where they can hide and feed and grow big. Once they're big enough they will start the annual migration that their parents did and return to areas like Kingmere Marine Conservation Zone to build their own nests and start the cycle again. So the black sea bream is protected in King Marine Conservation Zone, but so is the habitat that they use to nest. So this gravel over rock is really important for the black sea bream to make the, his nest. And here's an example of a nest, and you can really see clearly how the male has moved the um, sand and uh, rocks out of the way so that the female can lay her sticky eggs on the rock beneath. And the fish actually make their nests quite close together so you can see on this sonar image especially in the top part all these little nests together make a moonscape. Now there are lots of other species living within King Mere Marine Conservation Zone that aren't specifically protected but still benefit from it. We know that there are about 40 species of fish including this amazing Tom Pot Blenny who loves to live in crevices. We also have beautiful fish like Cuckoo Ras who live in groups and have dominant male and female and when the male uh, dies the female will actually change sex and become the dominant male. We have conga eels who hide in their lairs during the day and hunt at night with their amazing sense of smell. Now can you spot the undulate ray in this photo? It's an endangered species that loves living off our Sussex shore. So we have amazing fish here. But what about the invertebrates, those animals without backbones? So crabs have an amazing skeleton on their outsides that protects their delicate bodies inside. And if you look closely, you can see that he's feeding on these tiny snails. Now, if you look at this picture, I think you'll agree that sea slugs are infinitely better than land slugs. And we have dozens of different species, all ranging from about one to 10 centimeters long. They feed on very specific prey and their colors warn predators that they can sting. We also have about um, 40 different kinds of sponge and anemone. And here we have a daisy anemone that likes to appear in clusters. And this animal eats food as it drifts past, catching it with its tentacles. Here's another anemone called a dahlia anemone, and they're quite a bit bigger, about the size of a plate. And they can eat small fish, which they catch through stinging. You can see anemones on the seashore along our beaches, and we shouldn't touch them because although their stings can't really hurt us that much, we can also damage them by touching them. So let's look at some sponges. So here we have uh, the orange 
sponges which are called golf ball sponges and on the left the grey one is called an elephant hide sponge. If we look closely we can see the sponges structure and see the tubes that they use to filter feed with. So sponges are actually animals. Lots and lots of animals all living together. So this is another kind of animal called a bryozoan. Even though it's commonly known as Ross coral, it's actually not a coral. And its other name is the potato crisp bryozoan. And this really describes their texture and fragility really well. They grow at around two centimetres a year and can get up to be a, about 40 centimetres across. There are lots of large specimens at King Mere Marine Conservation Zone, which shows that the seabed is in relatively good condition. But it's not just wildlife that loves the sea and King Mere Marine Conservation Zone, people use it too. It's really um, a popular place for anglers to go and catch black sea bream when they're coming in to spawn. But we also use it for other businesses such as commercial fishing and also for aggregate extraction. So that's taking sand off the seabed for cement. So whilst it's a lot of fun angling here and diving, we need to be careful that we use the ocean properly and don't harm it. One of the government departments that protects King Mere Marine Conservation Zone are local fisheries managers, Sussex Inshore Fisheries and Conservation Authority. And it's their job to look after the fishing in this place. So back in 2013, they held a series of workshops to ask local fishermen and the community how they would like the site to be managed. And coupling that with environmental advice, they came up with the following um, rules. So these rules that the government and fishermen and conservationists developed together are the rules that are in place now today. However, the rules must be updated every four years because they need to check that the legislation is working and that the black sea bream and the um, fragile chalk reefs are still being protected. And they also need to keep up with the most recent scientific findings. Next year in 2021 will be King Mere MCZ's first official review. So watch this space. I've told you a lot about King Mere Marine Conservation Zone, but if you want to find out more, you can go to this website, www.kingmeremcz.uk. So King Mere Marine Conservation Zone is just one area of the sea off West Sussex, and it's fantastic that it's already protected. But what about the rest of our local sea? Keep listening to hear from Ella from the Sussex Wildlife Trust talk about an amazing new initiative called Help Our Kelp. So I hope that you've enjoyed hearing about why the ocean matters and also about King Mere Marine Conservation Zone. There is really amazing wildlife just under our waves. If this has inspired you to do more to protect the ocean and our planet, then you can look for, inf for more information on how to reduce your plastics or how to have a lesser carbon footprint on the Marine Conservation Society website. But that's enough from me. Um, Ella's going to tell you all about the amazing Help Our Kelp work. Thanks for listening. Bye.